Hi Year 12s. Today we're going to be looking at the fourth part of evolution, which is speciation. Uh, we're going to be covering the whole the whole PowerPoint in one video today. So there's only going to be one video for this topic. Uh, let's get started. Uh, as well as speciation, we're also going to look a little bit at ecosystems at the end as well. Just talking about succession, which should all should be revision from year 11 or stage 1 biology. Uh, let's get started. So, first off, we probably need to talk about speciation, and speciation is going to link very closely to last week when we were talking about, uh, so for temporal isolation, geographical isolation, things like that. Um, speciation ties very closely to that. So, speciation is basically, as we can see in the picture down below, uh, when one species, the founder species, over time, um, Populations of that species get separated for various reasons, um, evolve independently or change independently over time until they get to the point where they become two very different species that can no longer sexually reproduce and create fertile offspring. So over here we have our founder species turning into the Nihua finch and the Amakia. So, um, basically... Speciation is just populations gradually diverging from each other into separate species through the process of evolution or natural selection. Um, that occurs because when two, pop, uh, two populations of species become separated, they can't interbreed. They physically can't interbreed, and their natural selection will then act upon them in different, different ways based on the area that they're part of. Um, and this is what Darwin saw a lot of when he was going through the Galapagos Islands. He was looking at finches and Darwin's finches, and he noticed that all the birds were very similar, except they had different beaks. And that was a form of speciation because they'd been separated onto those different islands. They'd all evolved independently of each other and had obtained different style beaks based on the food that was on their islands, and consequently became brand new species. Um, there are two types of speciation. So the first one we're going to look at is allopatric speciation. Um, allopatric speciation occurs when there's members of an existing population and they're separated by a geographical barrier. So it could be like a river or a mountain, but they're physically separated. Um, that physical barrier causes the original population to disperse into the two populations. And obviously because they're now separated by that geographical barrier, they can't interbreed, which means the gene flow between those two species is going to be different. Now, over a long period of time, so multiple generations, this isn't going to be like 10, 20 years, this is going to be multiple generations of species. The independent changes in allele frequencies across those two different populations will result in the population is changing so much that they can no longer interbreed and they become new species. So two separate species from the founding species. So allopatric speciation, separated by geographical barrier, preventing them from interbreeding. And all of a sudden, time, long, lots and lots of time goes through. They haven't interbred. Their genes have evolved to suit them best. No longer can interbreed with each other. Two separate species. Uh, and our next form is sympatric speciation. So that's the result of a reproductive isolation between the two populations. So there's no physical barrier. The species just, for some reason, they can't interbreed with each other. So you could have ecological separation there, or isolation, behavioral isolation, temporal isolation. All of those processes we looked at in the last PowerPoint lead to sympatric speciation. Which leads us to the different types of evolution that we have to look at. So we've got convergent evolution. Now, convergent evolution is a tricky concept. Um, and look, the best example is when we're looking at a bird and a bat. Um, so first we'll talk about what convergent evolution is. So convergent evolution is the process where unrelated species independently evolve structural, biochemical, or behavioral characteristics due to similar selection pressures in their environments. So, ex best example is a bird and a bat. A bird is obviously a type of bird and a bat is a type of mammal. So they are very, very distinct and they've evolved away from each other or diverged away from each other a very long time ago. Um, I would not, I would say that a bat is more related to us than a bat is related to a bird because a bat is at least a mammal like we are. That being said, both birds and bats have wings. 
and those wings look very similar. They are analogous structures. They look the same, but their evolutionary origins are very different. Um, obviously, both birds and bats have had similar selection pressures, which have, have caused them both to, over time, evolve to have wings. But the structures are completely different. If you looked at the bones in a bird wing compared to the bones in a bat wing, they are very, very different. As I said before, the bones in a bat wing would more resemble our human arms than they would a bird wing. So convergent evolution, two animals or two species that have similar structures, but those structures have evolved independently of each other just to have the same characteristics due to the selection pressures in their environments. Um, then we have adaptive radiation. And adaptive radiation is, again, a little bit of a tricky, uh, tricky concept to get your head around. So it's the process in which organisms diverse rapidly from their ancestral species to a variety of new forms. Um, now, that process of adaptive radiation is more frequent when there's a change in the environment that causes new resources to be available. Those new resources cause new selection pressures, and those selection pressures are going to create new environmental niches. So they're going to have lots of species um, evolving independently of each other, but from a similar species. So again, mammals is the best example, and we've got mammals over here. So we've got, obviously, our ancestral species over here, insectivore stock. And over time, that has evolved into a large, very large um, variety of different animals. So we've got bats with wings. We've got primates, very similar to us. Okay, we've got squirrels. We've got carnivores like leopards. We've got whales and dolphins. We've got elephants. We've got seals. We've got aardvarks. All of those animals are closely related. They're essentially cousins. Now, we say that we're cousins with monkeys and apes. These are obviously further away than we are to our ape cousins, but they are all very closely related. So if I took any of these animals and compared them to a bird, they would be more closely related with each other than they are the bird. So, for example, the bats again. If I took a bat and compared a bat to a bird and I compared a bat to a whale, then the bat is going to be more closely related to the whale. Um, back when we were talking about convergent evolution, we said that the wings of a bird and a bat are analogous structures. So they have the same function, but they've evolved independently of each other. A homologous structure is that of adaptive radiation. So if you looked at the forelimbs in any of these species, so uh, the front uh, flippers of a whale, the wing of a bat, the arm of a monkey, the forelimb of an elephant, they all have the same bones as each other. They've just evolved differently and they look different, but the bones are the same. And we'll talk about that in another slide, but that's homologous structures. Um, so evidence from those homologous structures. So in The Origin of Species, Charles Darwin pointed out that there are similarities in organisms that are superficial. So the tail fins of whales and fish, they're analogous structures. Again, whales and fish, not closely related. Yes, they both have tail fins, but they've evolved independently of each other in their, because of their selective pressures. When he studied those analogous structures closely, they were very, very different. The bones in a fish tail fin are very different from the bones in a whale tail fin. They have different origins, but they have similar performing functions. That is convergent evolution. Homologous structures, on the other hand, they look very different, but they perform the same function across species. Darwin suggested in The Origin of Species that we looked at the forelimbs of a human, the forelimbs of a mole, the forelimbs of a horse, the forelimbs of a porpoise, and the forelimbs of a bat. And we're going to do that on another slide. They have the same bones in the exact same places. They have the same origin. They've differentiated because those limbs have had a different function in those species and they've had to evolve for that function. But they are the same bones. They don't prove evolution, so homologous structures do not prove evolution, but you cannot explain evolution 
without referring to homologous structure. So it's just another another fact that we have to support evolution, but on its own, it doesn't prove it. Lots of different things have to come together to prove evolution. So just in addition to talking about homologous structures, it is important that we also look at homologous structures. Um, so what we've done here is we've picked four mammals. We've gone for human, horse, dolphin, and bat. All four of these are mammals. Obviously, all four of these have very different forelimbs. Now, uh, humans, obviously, we have an arm. A horse, it will have a large horse leg, a front foreleg, a uh, front leg. Uh, dolphin is obviously going to have a flipper slash, you know, or a flipper. And a bat is going to have a wing. Now, truthfully, all of those limbs are very different, but they are made up of exactly the same bones as each other. So, for example, we all four of these species have a single bone in their proximal part of their forelimb, and that is the humerus. So that's the purple bone in all of these diagrams. So humans have their very long, slender humerus here. Horse have a very or have a smaller and a little bit thicker humerus. Dolphins have a very short, stumpy humerus. And the bats have a very thin, very, very thin humerus. Both of these, or all four of these species, also have two bones in their distal part, the radius and the ulna. Um, again, you can see the radius and the ulna and the green and the orange in the human arm. Uh, you can see the green and the orange in the radius and ulna in the horse here, in the dolphin, and a lot thinner and harder to see both of them there, but they are there. You can see the green and the orange there in the bat. You then have a group of wrist or ankle bones called the carpals, and that's in red. So here's our wrist bones in humans. Here's our, well, here's the wrist bones in a horse. Here's the wrist bones in red of a dolphin. Here's the very, very small belly able to be seen in the wrist bones in the bat. You then have your metacarpals in blue. So over here in humans. Here. So metacarpals are like the beginnings of your fingers. Um, less so in a horse, but they're still there. Dolphin, bat. And lastly, your phalanges or the actual tops of your fingers in yellow. And again, all four of these species have them. So all of them, all of these four mammals have exactly the same bones. Just they've evolved very differently. So for example, we've evolved arms and hands that can grab and grasp things. Horses have evolved them to be able to have strength in their running. So the tops of their fingers they're running on the tops of their fingers and standing on the tops of their fingers. So essentially you could say a horse is running on their toenail. A dolphin has evolved to have these very thick, large fingers that can push them through the water. Bats, very thin because they're going to be holding up large areas of skin or, um, or skin to help fly and glide through the air. But they all have the same bones. And that's really important. Homologous structures, very different but they have the same origins. Um, moving on to ecological succession. So ecological succession is the term we use to describe changes that take place in an ecosystem over time. Those processes involve modification of the environment by organisms that allow other organisms to survive. Two types of succession, as we remember from last year, primary and secondary succession. So. Primary succession is the unidirectional process in which a lifeless ecosystem becomes colonised by progressively more stable communities of living things. It generally occurs in nutrient-poor soil that, without succession taking place, would be incapable of sustaining life. The first stage that we have is the bare land is colonised by what we call a pioneering species, so the first species to make home on that bare land. Generally, that's rock. Um, they will colonise the rock and they will carry out life processes. So for most of these, all the time, it's going to be algae or moss or something like that. So photosynthesis. And then they'll eventually die and they'll decay. 
When they decay, the products that were once in that species become a source of nutrients for other living things. So other living things can come in and start to grow based on the nutrients that those dead organisms or the, dead organ uh, the decaying products of the pioneering species have left there. We have then intermediate species taking their place. Once all the species in the ecosystem possess necessary adaptions to survive and it's a stable community and changes are harder to make, we call that a climax community. We also have secondary succession. Secondary succession is, so we've already had um, primary succession take place, we've had a community start to thrive, etc. And then a natural disaster like a landslide or a fire or a hurricane, something like that comes along and it destroys a majority of the ecosystem. It disrupts the process of succession. Secondary succession will take place then, so there's new environmental conditions, so the ecosystem will start to change according to those environmental conditions, and succession will take place again. It's the second succession. Secondary succession, makes sense. Um, that should be the end of this PowerPoint. Um, sorry it was a long one.